Check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hey, one, two, three, four, five. Testing. One, two. Test, test, test. One, two. One, two, three, four. Okay. You mean some like some slides that I can scroll on it real quick and find out. Is that you? Perfect. I'm looking for my my cue from Kate, but I can't see her because of the lights. Are we good? All right. Indeed. All right, I think we're going to get started. So good afternoon, everyone. We buenas tardes. Oh, I figured that would get your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for joining us, uh, and thank you for joining this session titled Innovation in Financial Aid. And for those of you who are from parts of the country that don't thaw out until about April and May, a real special thank you for joining us in favor of us in, instead of this Southern California day. We really do appreciate it. Um, so we aspire to, uh, to meet your highest expectations for this session. I want to introduce the session just briefly and then uh, introduce the, the panel by name and title and institution and then provide maybe a couple of minutes of context and then ask our, our panelists to share with us their insights. Um, so the session is called Innovation in Financial Aid. And certainly in this conference, in this setting with your colleagues, innovation is abound, or innovation abounds, certainly. Uh, but in financial aid, I think that there is a special calling or compelling case for us to get innovative in what we do. And, and just to give you some context, there's a, imagine, and I don't have a PowerPoint for this, otherwise I would just go to the PowerPoint, but imagine a Texas size, I'm from Texas, a Texas size magnifying glass that is looking down or that allows others to look down at student financial aid. So in community colleges, this is a new. We have collectively been under a magnifying glass, I'd say for the better part of the last decade. In student financial aid, that magnifying glass has been magnified in that the scale with regards to the amounts of dollars that are invested by government, by private sector, and by institutions has so grown, exponentially grown over the decades. The federal student loan, I mean, sorry, the federal government alone invests more than $150 billion annually in student financial aid. If you look at student loans, if you look at Pell Grants, if you look at campus-based aid, if you look at tax credits. State governments certainly invest in respective, every state government has different policies for investments, but they invest themselves as well. And of course, many of our institutions through our foundational work and through our work have a dollars for associated for financial aid. So it's, it's no surprise that we have this magnifying glass looking over us. It's also no surprise that there are conversations abound at the federal level, at the state level, and frankly, on many of our campuses with regards to reforming student financial aid, with regards to looking at that complex world of financial aid and trying to, to improve it, as it were. And, and improve it certainly is a relative word. A couple of examples. In 2010, the Congress added provisions to the infamous Historical Health Care Reform Act that reformed the federal student loan program. It substantially changed how students borrow federal student loans, and in doing so, it made major redistribution of federal funds from student loans to grant aid. Pell Grant, specifically, was a great recipient of that redistribution. 
This last fall, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation commissioned several grants to more than a dozen organizations to think through what are their best thinking, their best ideas with regards to reframing student financial aid. And many of those policy papers are coming out. So those are just two examples of this magnifying class that's staring down at financial aid, and rightfully so. On college campuses, our students are still telling us to the day the student financial aid, even though they receive it, and even though they have money in their accounts, and even though they are enrolled and are progressing towards that degree that we want them to progress towards, that they still find that process somewhat complex. To be sure, there is work, hard work ahead in financial aid, but also to be sure, just as we have been innovated in addressing the issue of developmental education, just as we have been innovative in addressing many of the issues with regards to the college completion agenda, we have also witnessed a number of innovations in student financial aid. For efficiency, absolutely. For efficacy, absolutely. But also for simplification for our students. And to help us navigate three or four instances of innovation, and to help us together in this very large room develop a community of learning and this complex work of financial aid, we've invited uh, some expert panelists. And I'm gonna introduce them in the order that they're gonna speak. And then I'm gonna invite them to say maybe 20 or 30 seconds about their organization, about their institution, and then spend about four or five minutes talking about what is it that they're doing on their campus? What is it that they find innovative? And how is it that we can learn from that? So to get us started, we invited Michelle Wehr, who is Operations Associate in Young Adults and Post-Secondary Education at MDRC. Following Michelle will be Pat Zinga, who is Associate Dean of Financial Aid at Trident College in Illinois. Following Pat will be Angelia Millender, Vice President for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management at Broward College in Florida. And then leading the pack at the end, my colleague from Texas, Diane Pino, Vice Chancellor of Student Services at Houston Community College in Texas. Michelle, will you get us started? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I know it's the end of the day and many folks struggle to stick around, so I appreciate you coming to this session today. So my, as Jacob mentioned, my name is Michelle Ware and I'm an operations associate at MDRC. And many of you may know MDRC because of our evaluation role in achieving the dream. But as a corporation, we are a nonprofit that does social policy research to find out what works for low income families and children. Um, that's basically, that's our agenda, that's our mission, and we do research to find out what is successful. MDRC, beyond achieving the dream, is conducting research specifically in the area of financial aid. And in 2010, we launched the Aid Success Project to find out what works in the area of, of financial aid to help students succeed. And as part of our Aid Success Pilot, we worked with two colleges on a strategy called Aid Like a Paycheck. So what is Aid Like a Paycheck? Very simple. Aid Like a Paycheck changes the current financial aid distribution practices from dispersing aid one or two times a semester to dispersing aid in biweekly payments over the course of the semester. It is just that simple. It, in its nature, is a simple but innovative change in financial aid distribution. And as Jacob mentioned, the pilot started primarily with Pell Grant because Pell Grant is a, the largest fund of financial aid resources going to students. And how could we look at existing aid and what we could do with existing aid differently? So we're not talking about adding scholarship dollars, we're not talking about adding anything into the financial aid structure, but what can we do with existing aid? So we launched this pilot in 2010 and let me say, we are a research organization, but this was not a rigorous study. The pilot was really looking to see if this new distribution method was doable at campuses, what colleges, administrators, and students thought about this mechanism, and if there were positive indicators from students and staff about what this might look like, leading us to a potential larger rigorous study later. And the idea is really simple. How many of us get a lump sum payment in our life, if we win the lottery, um, you know, tax refund, and normally 
we've already thought about what we're gonna do with it, even if we were to win the lottery. I know I have a list of things that I might do with it. Students are, are the same way. They get these large lump sum payments and then they spend that money. And we expect that students will keep that money over the course of the semester and make wise choices. This strategy basically says, we don't necessarily think you're making the wisest choices, so let's change the distribution method and help you manage your money more effectively. Ideally helping you reduce financial stress, ideally helping you not increase work hours at the end of the semester because you've run out of money, ideally helping you make better choices over the course of the semester, which then will, MDRC hypothesizes, leads to better retention, better academic success, and just an overall better student success strategy. And I'm looking at my notes to keep me on five minutes because I have five minutes, but I could talk all day about aid like a paycheck. So as you know, and as Jacob mentioned, students have a variety of challenges, both academic and financial. And aid like a paycheck, which I think is an interesting strategy because it addresses the financial, but it can also, it can be done alone as a strategy, just a financial aid strategy, or it can be done in conjunction with any number of student success strategies on a campus. So imagine you've got a financial aid strategy on this side, you've got an academic strategy on this side, you've got a student support strategy thrown in for good measure, and then you're really reaching students in all the ways that they are challenged on your campuses. And so that's the way we are looking at Aid Like a Paycheck in general. Briefly, we piloted Aid Like a Paycheck at two institutions. MD, uh, MDRC, Mount San Antonio College in Los Angeles and Triton College in Illinois. And Pat Zinga is here to talk about the Triton experience. At both colleges, the institution was able to adjust their procedures to disperse aid biweekly over the course of the semester. And again, this was a question, how could colleges respond to this and were they able to do it, to get checks out on time to the students in the pilot? And if you look at this slide right here, you don't have to be able to read the numbers, but you can see visually the difference. The top two lines in white show what the college's normal distribution practices were. So to disperse aid in either one or two lump sums over the course of the semester. At the bottom in green shows what aid like a paycheck looks like. So that there were disbursements every two weeks to students over the course of the semester. And this is visually a striking difference, but we're also hoping that the research may bear some striking or some impacts for students on how this actually affects their ability to manage their money and maintain throughout the semester because they are not struggling and again, making not so successful choices because of financial difficulties they put themselves in. So what do students say? We conducted focus groups and students generally like the idea. Oops. Hit that, oh, well, let's fix that. Um, students generally like the idea of receiving smaller payments. They noted the value of being able to better manage their money. And we also analyzed records of 80 students from our Mount SAC pilot. Not a lot of students, but 80 students, and we compared them to students at Mount SAC who were comparable, who also received financial aid. And so the data suggests that the Aid Like a Paycheck students did modestly better than the comparison group of students. They enrolled in slightly fewer credits over the course of two terms, but they completed more credits over the course of those two terms, making them have an overall credit increase over students who were getting the lump sum distribution method. Again, not rigorous research, but these are the types of indicators that we wanted to see, that students were making choices about their units, about their work, um, and I can talk about work later if we have time, but they were making the types of choices that we wanted to see. And so the pilot suggested some positive um, outcomes. It also showed us that there weren't negative effects on students and there weren't negative effects on the college. So what we wanted to see is these positive indicators to really look to the future and say, does this show some promise and should we study this further? And so Pat Zinga again is here from Triton College and achieving the dream site to tell us some more about what this looked like at Triton. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Pat Zinga, and I'm the financial aid administrator at Triton College. Uh, Triton College is a community college um, in the suburbs of Chicago, and we serve approximately 25 communities. We have an overall student population of approximately 17,000. 
and uh, about 45% of our credit students are Pell eligible. Um, and like all of you, I'm certain um, from a financial aid perspective, we have seen our Pell uh, disbursements and numbers triple over the last five years. So Triton College was first approached in the summer of 2011 by MDRC and the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, which is our state um, aid administering agency, um, um, asking us to consider participating in the ALAP study. And Associate Vice President Mary Rita Moore and I attended the presentation, and I think we were both immediately intrigued um, by the concept of the program. We, um, in financial aid, see students every day who are floundering financially. And even when we provide funds to help them succeed, they don't always have the discipline or the skills to use that money wisely. So we're often disappointed with the choices that they make, yet in all fairness, many of our students have never had any discretionary money to manage. So we saw this study as a way to explore using existing funds more strategically to provide our students with experiential learning in the form of, or in the area of financial management and hopefully promote further student success. Fast forward, uh, we have just begun our third semester of participation in the study. And the goal in terms of the number of students participating has remained somewhat constant over the three semesters. However, um, in collaboration with MDRC, the study has evolved um, in a way that I think is designed to make it more closely reflect a model like our, if it was our disbursement policy. Um, and so in the first semester, um, we, we had to introduce it to the campus community and we conducted a pretty um, uh, robust recruitment effort. We um, invited interested students in to participate in information sessions and basically had a lot of touch points throughout the enrollment process. In the second term, um, with, the role, with the goal being to, I think, reduce the amount of resources required to um, implement the program, we simply emailed um, new eligible students, inviting them to participate. Additionally, we allowed our existing students from the first term to rejoin the study for the second term if they chose to. Um, and additionally, um, MDRC added a financial literacy component um, in the form of online modules that were emailed to the students every month. And um, the thought there was to reinforce the learning that was happening during the course of the semester. This term, um, in addition to once again inviting students back from the prior term, um, we revised all of our consumer materials and um, they reflect that we have two delivery methods and students are randomly assigned um, into the study. So we are you know, on our third week um, of, of the random assignment, so we really don't have any information from uh, that yet. Um, I think the small number of students participating at this time may not be too, uh, sufficient to produce any solid data. Um, and because students elected to join the study in the first two semesters, I'm not certain that that is reflective of the overall population, but I think that this semester will start to get a better um, feel for that. Um, I will say that 60% of the students who participated in the first semester um, chose to rejoin the study, 60% of eligible students chose to rejoin the study for the second semester. And from the second to third semester, 71% have um, rejoined the study. S and, um, and something I'm real excited about, um, one of those uh, students that's rejoining the study for this term was in the program last semester, but only with her grants. And she was a loan student, but she chose to have her loan dispersed in the regular disbursement uh, cycle. And she has asked us to add her loans into the biweekly payments for this semester. And so in my mind, that is evidence that there is learning happening here. I would conclude my comments um, by sharing a summary from our first semester focus groups. Overall, students describe participating in ALAP as a beneficial endeavor 
and they appreciated getting money earlier in the semester and more consistently throughout the semester. Most students mentioned the value of learning about money management and about spending money more realistically. Students felt they could put more focus on school when they didn't have to worry so much about finance. As one student noted, I get what ALEP is trying to do. It's weird to get your work salary in two lump sums, so why shouldn't financial aid be the same? Thank you. Good afternoon. I, too, appreciate that all of you are here this afternoon at 4 o'clock. My name is Angelia Millinder, and I'm the Vice President for Student Affairs at Broward College. Uh, financial aid is uh, under my direction, and you may have heard Bob Robbins, the Associate Vice President, with uh, two other uh, people from Broward speak at a financial aid session earlier today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a federal experiment that Broward College is uh, participating in right now. And let me tell you why. The name of the federal experiment, they had six of them. And if you happen to read your, the Federal Register leisurely, <laughs> you would have noticed that the federal government in November of 2011 uh, was asking for institutions to participate in six experiments. And of the six experiments, two of them were related to student loans. And many of us in the financial aid world, even though I don't do the work directly, I, with the regulations that you talked about, I have to be hands-on with financial aid. I have to know the regulations as well as the people who uh, report to me. So in looking at those experiments, five and six, that happened to do with uh, student loans, we were very interested in participating in those, and for obvious reasons, the national debt uh, with uh, student loans. In 2010, all of you know that loan, student loan debt exceeded the credit card debt. Additionally, uh, Broward uh, disperses about $168 million in federal student aid per year. It's gone down to 148 because of the elimination of the second uh, summer Pell. But with the loan limit, students can borrow as a dependent student uh, aggregate over their um, years in education, $31,000. If they're independent, as high as $57,000. And with our tuition being very low at a community college and most of our students having the zero EFC getting the higher limits of the Pell, if they add student loans to that with of your other packaging guidelines of SFEOG, uh, federal work study, any state aid, any scholarship aid, the money coming back to them in whether it's paychecks or uh, disbursements twice a semester or whatever your disbursement dates are can be quite a sum of money. We believe that some of the federal regulations may be encouraging overborrowing, especially for community college students. And if you pair all of that with the fact that our students are coming to us underprepared. We're struggling with keeping them in college because of their levels of academic preparedness on top of encouraging them to overborrow or borrow money that they may not need to cover the tuition costs. We are, I believe, as an educational leader, we are contributing to the problem. So I stepped up and said, yes, I want Broward College wants to participate in this experience so that we can see if we can change the regulations to give college administrators like Pat and many of us in this room flexibility to limit the amount of loans that students take. Now the experiment is only around the unsub portion, which right now is the higher uh, loan uh, interest, 6.8 percent, because it was authorized to um, keep the other rate at 3.4. 
So we're talking about unsub loans. Now, we were very bold and very courageous. We did not come out of the gate half-stepping on this particular project. We went for the goal. And let me show you what happened for going for the goal. And our students didn't complain. <laughs> we had five students to complain that they didn't get their unsubsidized loan. Look at this. Oh, that's yours. You didn't show them. Look at that. In 2012 fall, we had $6 million going to students in unsub loans. The same time in fall 2013, it is down to 1.2. That is affecting a huge change. The numbers went from thousands of students getting unsub loans to less than 500, 600 getting unsub loans. Then when you look at winter, it was 63 this time last year. And now it's down to a half a million this time, this same time right now. So we are clearly impacting um, the loans. And on top of this, we had already started in 2008 giving financial literacy workshops, helping students to uh, learn more about debt, why they're borrowing, how they're going to pay it back. And so this, on top of that, we believe is making a huge difference. And I believe because of the financial literacy workshops, before we did this, it helped the students to understand that maybe they didn't need to borrow all that money, and they could manage get going to school with direct educational costs and cost of attendance and still make a difference and not have to strain on their resources. Here are the numbers. In 2012 last year, you can see that we had about 3,000 borrowers. It's down to 699. Same time last year was 3,213. It's down to 624. The average loan amount also decreased. Um, in both years, same time comparison. And this is what we used. I don't, I don't know if that slide is there. But if you want it, that's somebody else, sorry. <laughs> if you want to know what our criteria was to get to these numbers, we decided not to look at the aggregate amount of debt that student already had to make our determination. We, we looked at more so the higher cost programs, the students who got no, no Pell at all, and those students who uh, had nursing or transportation or the aviation type programs where it was higher. And so that those students would feel no strain, we gave them the unsubsidized loan. So those are the students in that number, as well as those who had to pay three times the tuition because they were out of state. If you have any other questions, I can answer them later, or do I answer them now? Here's a question. Yeah, what you mean, did they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have any, uh, our enrollment loss was due to other reasons, but not student loans. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Diana Pino, Vice Chancellor for Student Services at Houston Community College. And uh, Houston Community College is huge. We have a uh, about 75,000 students, that's including our credit as well as our continuing education students. We have six colleges and 22 campuses. And we have about 37,000 students receiving some uh, form of financial aid. Uh, Jacob had mentioned earlier about the increases that we've been seeing in uh, the number of applicants and uh, those receiving financial aid. And I suspect that uh, many of you have are at colleges like mine where your staffing doesn't necessarily increase at the same pace. How many of you kind of are in that situation? Let me just kind of take a quick poll here. <laughs> All righty. So we have to get a little more creative. No, let's be realistic. A lot more creative on uh, the ability to provide information to our students. And uh, with financial aid, I always say financial aid is the most complex area within student services. 
And it's also one of the greatest potential uh, retention tools as well. And so one of the things that we've done at Houston Community College is really try to look to technology to uh, really help us with the financial aid processing and getting information out to our students. We've done a lot in the, the side of automation with our uh, system, uh, trying to relieve individuals from doing manual processes to things that just you know happen automatically with the push of a button. But in terms of uh, information to students, uh, we ha there's two uh, products that I'm going to uh, share with you that we've subscribed to that has, have helped our students tremendously. One of which is Financial Aid TV, and you're kind of seeing right here uh, a snapshot of what that looks like. And I'm gonna take you briefly just to see a quick demo. Uh, basically what you're seeing here is our web page and uh, we have here, it has uh, all of the videos, it's approximately uh, 60 videos and that includes uh, some prepackaged videos because of course financial aid is uh, pretty much financial aid wherever it is that you attend. So there's some uh, you know, basics that are out there. But also it gives us the ability to uh, do our own videos that might be specific to Houston Community College. In addition, you can have uh, videos that are related to your particular state. Uh, we also have a, a pretty robust uh, number of veteran students that I didn't include in that 37,000. We have about 4,000 veteran students, and we have videos that relate to uh, information, particularly with the GI Bill. Uh, financial literacy, we've heard from uh, some of my colleagues here that, of course, that's something that's very uh, important for us to try to educate our students because, uh, as she mentioned, uh, they aren't always um, having the ability to have that level of funds. And then once you get those funds, you know, what do you do about uh, making sure that you're spending them on appropriate uses? And then, of course, uh, default management. So you're seeing a list of various videos. Uh, also, you can see uh, uh, what those most popular videos are. And it's kind of interesting because uh, this program does have analytics so you can kind of see uh, what are students looking at um, and what kind of interests they have. So I'm just gonna give you a quick little preview. Uh, let me see, let me pick one, let's see. I wanted to show you, I'm not seeing it real quick. One of the most common questions is, where is my refund? You could spend a whole day talking to students about where their refund is. That's what's most important to them. Uh, but let's go ahead and play one uh, on, uh, we'll just choose this one here. There's no audio. <laughs> oh, well that puts a kink in things. Should, should, I, uh, should I maybe act it out? <laughs> Would that help? Maybe with the microphone yeah, there? Yeah. Please. Yeah. Oh, this one. Okay, I pay for technology, I don't develop it. <laughs> so let's give it a shot here. We'll just play applying for financial aid. Well, that's not helping, let's see. Well, let me describe it to you. So basically, you typically have a student that's asking the question, and then you have uh, someone basically telling you what the answer is, because uh, I'm sure your students are like ours too. Uh, how many of your students typically maybe don't read? <laughs> have challenges with reading? Is that, let me see a show of hands, yeah. But you know what, sometimes we don't read either. We're just in that culture where it's much easier just to kind of see a video. So that's what the beauty of this is. Not to mention, it's available 24 seven. 
So it doesn't matter uh, when your students are looking for the answer, they can come here and find uh, pretty much almost every answer uh, to their question. So with this, uh, just in January alone, we had about 5,000 videos that were played, and over a year's time, over 60,000 uh, videos that were played. So it's really taking uh, time that our staff would be trying to uh, answer these questions and giving them another opportunity to do that. But you get the idea here. One last thing I wanted to show you was another tool that we use. It is a knowledge base. And it's by IntelliResponse. And it's for all of our uh, questions. It's not just uh, financial aid specific, but we have a lot of financial aid uh, questions and answers programmed into it. And again, it does have analytics as well, so you can t find out what are the most frequently uh, asked questions. And also, it lets students rate uh, the question so you know whether or not it answered their specific question. So you might not be able to see it real well here, but it has the top 10 questions that have been asked. And so they basically type in their question here, and uh, it will bring up uh, the closest answer to it but we have uh, the pre-populated questions. But you can see with the top 10, the first one is, how and when will I receive my financial aid? Uh, what types of financial aid uh, do you have available? When and where can I see my awards? Uh, will my financial aid pay for my books? So these are the most commonly asked questions, and um, we have hundreds of questions that are already built in here, but you know how much time it takes uh, to, for financial aid and to uh, be able to give this information. So that's a preview of our uh, resources that we have uh, available to students in an electronic format, and so hopefully you'll find it useful. Thank you. Okay, very exciting. So I know that you are on the edge of your seat, ready to ask a few questions. And rather than ask you specific questions to your programs, because I heard three very different, very creative ways of communicating with students, of delivering financial aid, and of putting some stops on the borrowing that is occurring. I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions that maybe cut across all, all of the experiences, and then uh, we'll talk about that a little bit, and then I'm going to then invite uh, those of us in the audience to ask specific questions to our panelists. What was the genesis? What were the conversations that took place at your campus, at your organization, that led you to that point to say, yes, we have to do that. Yes, we have to be bold. Yes, we have to engage this evaluative format. What were those conversations that occurred on the campus that sort of were the genesis that allowed you as a senior administrator and your colleagues to say we have to endeavor in this space, even if it means thinking or acting outside of the boundaries, if you can, um, as in any order you want. Can you hear me? Yes. So I will speak from MDRC's perspective. What started us down this path was really our financial aid um, research agenda that we are trying to develop. So MDRC has done research in performance-based scholarships, but that's additional financial aid. So we're looking at the same types of uh, research to try and build a body of evidence that will speak to financial aid as a whole. But we were approached by TICAS, the Institute for College Access and Success, that has a lot to do with student loan debt, and they are looking at making college affordable, and they were really looking to partner with us to figure out how can you really, as Jacob was saying, redesign financial aid and revamp it and do things that would be policy relevant, not too difficult for colleges to implement, and yet have an effect on student success. So that was basically the genesis for us. At Triton College, I think the conversations were um, basically about um, our, our meetings with students, even um, students who have the, the funds, are provided the funds through financial aid, um, and, you know, these are not students who um, would abuse federal student aid programs. These are students who come to us with good intentions and want to get a degree, but simply don't have the skills um, to use these funds wisely. And 
I think that for us, the impetus was trying to find a way to um, not only help them when they're in college, but hopefully provide lifelong um, skills in money management. And so it was um, about, about student success, about helping our students use the funds that they're receiving um, to their best advantage. Well, there were many conversations that we had because financial aid is um, the lifeline for many of our students and has become the tuition payment resource for our institution um, because of the declining state money um, that we haven't been receiving since 2007. So when you look at um, the stability of the institution, and then you also look at um, how can we impact the society as a whole and our students in that society and not saddle them with a lot of debt, that's one thing, and still keep our tuition affordable. Also, our Board of Trustees took a bold move and didn't raise our tuition mm -hmm. so that it doesn't continue to where you, you, you're going to reduce the amount of money that they can borrow, but then your tuition rates continue to go up. That didn't make very much sense either. So we were having a lot of conversations about the default rate and, and many of different things that led us to participate in these things and take some bold moves and courageous moves. Well, financial aid for uh, Houston Community College, and I suspect uh, all colleges, is something of interest from all constituents. It's not just a student services thing. F faculty uh, hear their students in the classroom talking about not being able to purchase books or, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. There are those personal stories of frustration and, um, uh, you know, that really ha have administrators as well as, uh, you know, frontline staff individuals saying what can we do to make things better uh, for our students. Not to mention it has the potential to have a huge impact on enrollment because if students don't have their funds then they're not able to register and continue into classes. And so it, it's not um, anything that's, uh, you know, anything um, I guess original because I think you all experience the same thing but it's really looking at uh, I'm always coming to these conferences to steal ideas. So I, I think you all do too. I don't care about borrowing. I'll steal them. I'll do whatever I have to to try to find ideas that are going to make things better for uh, our students. But it's about how do we process as quickly as we can? How do we get the money in the student's hand? How do we help them to manage that money? Uh, there's a lot of factors that we're dealing with, and uh, it's a conversation that is not going to uh, go away anytime soon. Keep the microphone, Diane. So I'm going to ask another question that I'm sure it's resonating across the room. What about resources? So in some cases, you're engaging MDRC as an evaluative consultant. Um, and I don't know what the, what the expenditures are. I'm sure Michelle can talk about that. In other cases, it may not be external resources with regards to cost, but there are resources. There are requirements on your staff, as Angelia talked about, and, and others. How did those conversations go? How did, how did you get uh, the administration sort of to buy into the reallotment of resources or new resources in the case of the evaluation? Well, I think I happen to be very fortunate. You know, for one, I'm sitting at the table with the, the cabinet, uh, including our chancellor, and um, I've been at Houston Community College for three years now. And uh, from day one, there has always been a support for uh, financial aid. And really, it's kind of, of course, resources aren't um, uh, endless, but it's really looking at, and I, you know, I work with my financial aid director too, you know, show me what you need and how it's going to make things better. And it's not, it's not anecdotal, but on paper, show me the numbers. If I give you X, Y, and Z, what is that going to buy me? What is it going to do for our students? How is it going to make their lives better? So uh, we really have the support of uh, all administration. It's really just trying to find the best way to go about um, you know, providing the, the uh, financial aid to our students. And uh, really, the financial, aid, financial literacy piece is important to us as well. Thank you. 
Well, we didn't want, well, I didn't want my staff, and we talked about this, to just ask for resources or more resources for the sake of asking for them. We decided to take a step back. Um, in 2012, we decided to uh, map our processes for greater efficiency, and we felt we would do that first to see if there was a way that we could automate some processes to take out the lack of efficiency and, and streamline our processes to serve our students better, and then we could better identify where the gaps were that we needed to hire more people or to outsource a function so that our staff could have one-on-one -on -one time with students rather than just transactional customer service. So after we did that, adding on the experiment was a natural. We had time to do it because we weren't doing all the other busy things that we were doing that didn't do anything but yield inefficiency and continue to get the same results by doing the same thing over and over and over again. Thank you. At Triton College, I think the, um, the outlay in terms of resources for the first semester was more substantial because we had to um, do some programming changes in order to accommodate the um, eight disbursements throughout the semester rather than one um, disbursement. And there were resources involved in the recruitment effort. Um, however, with our arrangement with MDRC, um, we received support um, for that uh, project. In the second semester, all of the steps were in place. And because we went to um, the email um, communication with students, um, it really was not terribly labor intensive. It really went very smoothly. We, we said, wow, this is going pretty easy. Yeah. Um, and certainly this last semester, because again, we changed that study a little bit. We had to revise our consumer materials to stay compliant. So there were a few extra steps at that point, um, but it has not been, um, it's not, it has not been as labor intensive as you would have thought. Terrific. So in terms of MDRC, we received a grant from the Gates Foundation um, and from the Institute um, of College Access and Success to pilot this study. And we transferred some of that money to the colleges to help them implement. But I think a couple things in terms of resources are important. So our our idea for this pilot was to really see what it took to make this happen so we could look at what efficiencies could be built in so to see if this could be a more cost effective way of dispersing financial aid. And so a couple instances which we still hope to study are things like return to Title IV funds. So if you're dispersing aid in a way that is more in line with students' actual enrollment, are you then returning less funds to Title IV and spending less resources and time as an institution trying to make that happen? And so looking at the give and take of the resources that are being allocated in certain ways. We're also looking to engage um, uh, the entities that do financial aid programming, so Elysium that now has data tell and banner, could they develop systems in place to make aid like a paycheck a standard operating way? So if colleges were to implement it, it would not be uh, resource heavy, rather you could do what you do as a college, and since I don't work at a college, I can't speak in those terms, but you could do what you do, and it would be very easy because there is a system in, in place. But again, over the long term, our reality is to look at what the resources are and really look at the cost effectiveness of a like a paycheck. So, to try and out three very different ways of reading thinking financial aid. Um, you've got some data already. You've got some early successes. You've got an evaluation that's taking place. What are the conversations that are either taking place or that will take place a year from now that will allow you to institutionalize these new practice? Well, what needs to happen? <laughs> what needs to happen at Triton? What needs to happen at Broward, at ACC, for you to say a year from now or two years from now, this is it. This is now not a pilot, not a test, but this is our new policy. 
So um, when I talked about the IT um, uh, requirements in that first semester, uh, we're currently operating on a homegrown COBOL-based system. And so it was um, a matter of uh, meeting with a programmer and editing our current check run to accommodate the multiple disbursements. We are, however, in an implementation of Elucian. And Elucian does not come delivered with the capability to do these multiple disbursements. So um, we have had some conversations with MDRC and we are looking at finding a customization mm. um, so that we can continue. So I would say in the short term, it's, it's having a system that will accommodate this. Um, in the long term, once we, once we get past that hurdle, I would like to see us scale this up so that we can get some data and see if in fact it really is making a difference um, beyond focus groups and student feedback. Um, since the uh, experiment is prescribed by the federal government, we will be in it, they project, uh, two to three years. So okay. we will continue to collect our data and give it to the federal government with the end goal, hopefully, they will allow us as institutions to have some flexibility in uh, determining uh, the student loan limits, how much, you know, measured approach, things of that nature, rather than just allowing a full swoop borrowing of, you know, five to ten thousand dollars, you know, higher than what your Pell and your other tuitions cost, and encourage students to use free money more than money that you have to pay back later. So we hope that our work in the experiment will change the regulation. That's why we're in it. We're in it to win it for the long haul for everybody in this room, if that's your thinking on student loan debt. Uh, both of these uh, initiatives are excellent and uh, they've been on my radar for some time. Aid like a paycheck, uh, love the idea. I think the, the thing that um, uh, could keep me up at night is, uh, some of you might be similar where you have several sessions, uh, many, many sessions within a specific term. So we have 16 week, 12 week, first eight week, second eight week, four week, six week, five week. And so, uh, you know, aid like a paycheck, we have students that also take classes in all those varying sessions. And of course, we're all, always trying to um, look at, you know, how do we also make sure that our, um, uh, college man, man, uh, maintains its financial health in students, you know, uh, dropping out and then having return of Title IV and so forth. It, it's, uh, as was mentioned, really the programming in your uh, student system uh, really has to be, you know, top notch. And I think that's where the majority of the work would uh, occur. And, you know, j trying to put those measures in place to make sure that um, it's done in a way that the uh, financial health of the institution is is maintained. Thank you. Please. So I did want to say, if MDRC would like to see this expanded, and I'm glad I let my colleagues go first, um, because these are all the ways that we would like to see Aid Like a Paycheck move. Um, we'd like to see what the interaction is with loans. Um, to see if it can reduce borrowing in a different way than this does perhaps. We've talked to Pat about, let's say that you have a student who's receiving a student loan, they're receiving it in aid like a paycheck form, and you have the possibility to intervene at some point in the semester to talk to that student about the fact, do they need all of their student loan for the rest of the term? Could you reduce immediately their loan indebtedness at that point? So how do loans interact with this? How, with the multiple starts, what would aid like a paycheck be with multiple starts? And ultimately, being MDRC, our vision is to really expand this and test this with some rigor to see the long-term results of our impacts of retention and persistence and degree accumulation. We think it's going to be, there will be small impacts, but looking at the number of students who are receiving financial aid at your institutions, even those small impacts could be substantial. And so we're hoping that we can then transfer that knowledge and then provide it to the colleges to make the decisions about whether or not aid like a paycheck makes sense. Thank you, Michelle. You're speaking to a crowd of dreamers and <laughs> innovators, and my guess is you're gonna get a lot of volunteers after that comment. So one observation, then I'll invite our guests to, to ask our questions. Angelia, what you're doing is so critical 
we have, we have this paradoxical policy where we want to have student aid, student loan aid available to all of the eligible students, and yet we also want to be able to manage that loan. And currently, the policy is all eligible students as much as they're eligible. And so I think that it's an important uh, experiment for all of us to learn from it. So I'm going to invite those of you uh, in to, to ask a question. Kate's going to come to you and, and, and give you the microphone so that we can speak. We are being recorded. Um, the question that I have is, actually I have two questions. Um, one is with the small loan, or with the small disbursement of financial aid on the first week, were you having problems with that, not covering money for books or anything? Um, tuition is paid first, and students are uh, provided their excess grant in the bookstore, and the um, incremental payments are that balance after that. Okay. Um, the other question that I had was regarding the uh, return to Title IV, and I'm just wondering how how is that managed? I mean, if a student stops halfway through, how do you manage that money? Um, if the student fully withdraws, um, just like any other situation, they're subject to return to Title IV. We perform the calculation, and the money dispersed is the money dispersed. Okay. Let me add quickly that luckily in the pilot, we have not had many students who have withdrawn. So we haven't had the return to Title IV issue, so I need to be truthful and say we're not sure how that bears out. But we do think that because the money is more closely tied to tuition that it would make things easier. I will say happily, we haven't had students in the pilot who have withdrawn, so that's a good thing. Um, and then what was your first question? Because I had something else. Oh. So every college, there have been two in the pilot, they have adjusted their policies to disperse the book money first and then aid like a paycheck after. Any questions? How y'all doing? Um, what would y'all say about students who have, like who doing good in classes, they real successful and have no problem managing their own funds? Like would those students be able to still like keep up with their same routines that they already doing or would they have to change and jump into like the new policies as well? I'm, I'm a student, by the way. <laughs> so are you going to make exceptions to the rule? So I guess my response is that each college most certainly would be different, but I would say that the current practice of financial aid distribution was never tested. Um, so it just is what it is. Ultimately, if we do test this and find out that it affects student success for the larger population of students, then I would say that each college may have some type of mechanism in place to address special circumstances or to address, um, you know, students who can manage their money. But ultimately, I think it's a matter of looking at this as a student success measure overall versus an individual measure for students. Um, and that's the way financial aid is currently. That's an MDRC opinion. If Pat has a different one, I would have her. Diane has a comment. <laughs> Do you go to HCC? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, okay, TCC. fellow Texan. Well, um, you know, again, hearing uh, this initiative in the past, your, your question is uh, one of the things that I've pondered over because even right now where we do give our students their refund in uh, one lump sum, uh, you know, we're constantly getting calls about uh, when is my aid coming in. Uh, I fear that if we were to, um, you know, go forward and implement that we're going to have many students like yourself saying, I can manage my money. And some truly can, but some perhaps are needing the money because they haven't managed their finances in the past and they're using it to pay for some uh, things that they have that may or may not be uh, school related. So I think we're still in unchartered territory, so we're going to have to work through uh, that. But, you know, I think sometimes too, um, students would, you know, there's some things that students would love too that we know aren't probably the best for them, because, but everybody likes to, uh, you know, go the past path of least resistance. 
So if someone told you you can get your degree in a year or four years, uh, let's say a bachelor's degree, who's going to pick four years, right? But perhaps we feel as though the amount, the amount of content that we need to teach someone is, uh, you know, it requires us to do it in four years. I'm just trying to give like a hypothetical. But I'm saying that with the, uh, uh, you know, trying to relate to, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, and I think you represent a uh, good percentage of our students, at least at Houston Community College. Well, I think before we put, take the next question, I think that's a good cautionary note. If we get to the point where this becomes the delivery mechanism for disbursement, that we might still allow both in institutional policy and, to, and perhaps in regulatory policy an allowance for discretion at the campus level, which is important. Yes. Uh, and Diana, I think you voiced some of the things that were rattling around in my mind with regard to return of Title IV and some of the other things. There's a number of regulations that are very prescriptive about book allowances and about the amount of time that you're allowed to disperse the aid to the students once it hits the accounts. And then how did y'all address that in the Aid to Paycheck uh, program? As I mentioned earlier, we are providing for the book allowance um, as required. And um, yes, federal regulations say you have 14 days to disperse federal student aid. Um, however, it's estimated student aid until it hits your general ledger. And so we are not drawing down funds and we are not posting it to our general ledger until we disperse it. Linda, you had a question? How you doing? Um, I'm Evan Gonzalez. I'm currently a student at Kingsborough Community College. And um, I have a question about the delivery and effectiveness of this system. And because I, I, I'm being a student, I know it's hard to get one check for the year. So getting multiple checks each week or for the month, would that be, would it be quicker? Would it be easier to get the check? At least because that would be beneficial. Then I would see the benefit in finding this, this type of system. I will go ahead and answer this so I can talk about both institutions. So yes, um, the reason that we piloted this was to make sure that it didn't slow down the process of a student getting financial aid. So would this be too difficult and that colleges weren't able to make it happen? It relies on the fact that colleges can do it on a schedule and let students know what that schedule is so students know when to expect that check and the colleges can make that happen. But the other thing that colleges, and I'm not sure if Triton did it, but I know Mount SAC did, they actually talked with students to change the way that they were dispersing aid. So at Mount SAC, a number of students were receiving checks, but they talked to the students about changing it to electronic funds transfer. And so that, that those funds were hitting those students' accounts the minute that it was done. Students, by and large, who were getting the lump sums were still getting checks, and they were still waiting for those checks in the mail. But because they knew these checks were coming every two weeks, and they wanted them quicker, they changed to electronic funds transfer, and it's actually worked better for students. I will just say that we had a student that we call our poster child for Aid Like a Paycheck, and the student had two jobs, um, had two jobs for a lot of her college career and never quit her two jobs because she just was never managing her money correctly. And one of her fears with Aid Like a Paycheck is, I don't believe I'm gonna get these checks on time, and so I'm still going to keep this job. And after the first semester of seeing that it was possible and she was getting her check, she said she finally quit her second job because she didn't need it. She had this check coming in and it was like a paycheck, so she quit the second job. So it is doable and certainly that's part of the pilot to make sure that students are getting their money on time. Oh, and there are handouts on the table about Aid Like a Paycheck. If you've run out, I have some more if you have um, I just wanted to add something based on what Michelle said. In our first semester, we cut paper checks. And with the new system, we plan to go electronic. But at this point, we're still paper checks. And um, in the first semester, we were cutting the checks like the day before the schedule date. And so um, the students weren't getting them on the date, in the mail, on the date that was on that schedule. And we got beat up, OK? So we had to resolve that pretty quickly. When you tell them they're going to have it, they want it in their mailbox that day. So we had to make a few adjustments to when we cut the checks to make sure that they had them on the date that was on the schedule. 
Mr. As, as we bring the microphone to Linda, uh, I'll just make an observation as a moderator listening to this conversation. It's, I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing that we're having a conversation about fundamentally changing processes and delivery frameworks and we're getting real-time feedback from the students who really do need the financial aid. <laughs> Linda. Just more of a, a comment, I guess, and a, a bit of a concern. I'm like you, I'm thinking of the, the losing sleep over this, is that maybe to, um, to the people that are actually running the pilot is to expand the pilot to different institutions because you're moving over to illusion and you're gonna see the limitations that we have um, because of that system. And so we're fixing one thing and creating a whole other issue that is, is going to, again, stretch our resources, stretch, um, affect the image of our financial aid office that we work so hard um, to, you know, students love to hate us. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> in Texas, we say our financial aid office is like the, the cowboys, you, you know, hate us or love us. But um, the other thing, too, is I, I want, I mean, we had a huge issue a few years ago where our students were complaining because we had a book um, purchase uh, system where students went to our bookstore on campus that's run by Barnes and Noble and they charged books and supplies and then the, the refund was calculated after that. Well, they were saying, you're forcing me to buy from Barnes and Nobles. And so we had local bookstores coming to us saying, you know, this isn't right. We had students coming to us saying, I'm having to pay, you know, $50 for a backpack that I can get at Walmart for $15. So those kinds of things that, you know, you're, again, you're addressing one issue and, and creating others. The other is um, the types of students, and it's not just the book allowances. We've got nursing students that have to purchase um, equipment and uniforms right up on top, you know, right at the beginning. We've got cosmetology students that have to purchase a $600 kit, you know, to start the semester. So it's real easy to say we're going to give you a $400 book allowance, and then we've got students that are, you know, that's not enough for them. And so again, you're you're finding yourself working on exceptions, and that is time consuming and 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 resource draining, and so all those things. So I just, I guess, ask that whoever if if you continue the pilot that may be different institutions and different circumstances and so that it be expanded to um, other areas too. So let me make a couple of comments. First, Triton is, the bookstore policy um, at each college is different and, and from MDRC's perspective, it is basically following the regulation of dispersing aid up front so students can meet their book and supply needs. How each college does it was really dependent on whatever the college practice was at that college. So MDRC didn't come in and say, you have to put the money in the bookstore and do the calculation after. As a matter of fact, Mount Sac did it differently. Mount Sac just did it the same way they already do it for all their students. They calculated the percent that they were going to give up front. They dispersed that to students in the same way they would have dispersed book money up front. And then they did the calculation for aid like a paycheck. So the upfront money is not an MDRC thing and it's not a, a necessarily an aid like a paycheck thing. It's really going in line with how your college chooses to disperse book and supply money to its, to its students. But the other thing is, Linda, thank you very much for making the plug for any college who wants to help us with the expansion because yes, we realize we do need to test this out in other places besides the two that we have. California is not the norm. It's got such low tuition and students are getting such large refunds back. That's not the norm of every place. Um, so we do need to look at these different scenarios and different institutions. So thank you, Linda, and you guys all have my name and expansion certainly is where we wanna go because we do wanna see um, and I will just say this from my perspective. In working with our colleges, we also worked with them when two Pells in a year was instituted. And it was instituted, colleges had to do it, they made all kinds of changes, and then it got pulled back because the fiscal impact wasn't really addressed. Our desire is to address all the issues before it's put into policy to make sure that if it goes into policy, it is the right policy, and we've looked at what the implications are. So as we, as we wait for the next question, 
I just want to make an observation. There's financial aid administration and there's financial aid counseling. And we've been focusing on the processes and the different deliveries. But I heard all three campuses talk about embedding in your practice financial literacy. And financial literacy to me is a first cousin, if not a sibling, of financial counseling. So it seems to me that even as we're innovating the delivery and the efficacy of our programs and our processes, that we're also beginning to say, and our students need to learn this. And I think that's an important component. So please. Thank you. In the context of um, these pilot schools that have a like a paycheck, and in thinking about building in cost effectiveness, efficiency, was there some thought put into the pay date? And if you've thought about uh, bringing together perhaps the, per, uh, the, you know, the payroll function of the college and having that overlap with these every two week checks being sent out to students. So by and large, we left that up to the college. I think it is a good observation and something that we should probably talk to colleges about more directly in terms of aligning their own internal systems. But I would say that by and large, we, the colleges determine those dates. And I can't say specifically if they tied those to payroll or what other types of internal practices they tied them to, I, I honestly don't know, and maybe they did, but thank you for pointing that out because I think that's information that we should find out if, that, if they are tied to those or if they are separate and are there some efficiencies in tying to that. I have another question about aid like a paycheck, sorry, to the rest of the panel <laughs> for neglecting you. Um, it's just about uh, the title, Aid Like a Paycheck, and I wonder whether you guys have received any pushback um, based on the idea that, um, uh, the stereotype, I guess, that, that students are using aid in inappropriate ways, and I wondered whether you thought about changing it as you think about expanding. So we've received a little bit of pushback, but by and large, people like the name. I will say that I have been at places where there may be one person who pushes back and then everybody else in the room pushes back on them and I don't have to say anything because I think a lot of people like the name. But I also think that it, it, they like the name because it helps students change the perspective of I am a student and my job in some ways is to be a student. And so if my job is to be a student, then my financial aid is like a paycheck for doing my job as a student. Yes, we've received some feedback. Have we thought about changing the name? Yes. Are we going to change the name? Probably no. <laughs> Yay. Um, how are you all? Um, just a comment on what she just said. I think the name is pretty good. I think it, it'll motivate people to go to school. Getting a paycheck for going to school doesn't sound too bad to a lot of people in low income, you know, families and neighborhoods. So I think that it'll be beneficial to people and getting them motivated to come to school. Uh, also, a like a paycheck, I feel like it'll like nip in the bud a lot of people who just get the money and splitting like real fast. That way, you know, good idea. So that was a quantitative study of two, and 100% of the respondents agreed. So. So, Angelia, um, with regards to the, the, um, the reduction of borrowing that is, a, that is occurring on the campus um, with the flexibility provided by the experimental sites, it, in the previous experience uh, when some colleges, and there are still some colleges in the, in the nation who do not participate in the federal loan programs, they just don't. Uh, we, we had concerns, collectively, we had concerns that absent that federal loan opportunity, the students were borrowing through, through payday loans, through off, sort of off-site loans. They were not necessarily having the same benefits in terms as the federal loan program. Are you, how are you controlling for that? How are you monitoring for that? How are you looking at whether your students or how your students are essentially making up for that reduction? Because some of the reductions that you showed are pretty substantial, certainly at the aggregate level and at perhaps even at the student level. Sorry. 
We want to have uh, meaningful conversations with our students about what their needs are. We're not um, actually controlling for whether they're going to payday loans or taking alternative loans. We didn't have, we don't have that many of our students who take alternative loans. At any point at Broward, we had maybe 70 students, and we have 65,000 who um, ever took a private or alternative loan. Now, I don't know that limiting student loans uh, in the way that we're doing it, we're only doing the unsub. They're getting their full sub. So they're getting full Pell and their full sub. So it's only the unsub that can be limited as part of this experiment. But we're not controlling for their borrowing habits. They may borrow that even if they got the other loan. We're not, we're not sure of that. But what we want to do through that financial literacy piece is talk to our students about the value of money and how much money they actually need to uh, pay their direct and indirect educational cost. We believe that educating our students would be number one and foremost, and what we're doing is just providing that structure to make them, to help them make that decision that I don't need all of that debt rather than looking at it as available cash now and not knowing that they have to pay that back at a higher rate every time that they go into forbearance or defer their loan payments or whatever the case be, they do over that period of four years, two years or whatever. So. We're not going there yet. It's not necessarily part of the experiment. It's not something that we thought about. But looking at the demographics of our students, we had already seen their borrowing reduce as a result of the financial literacy. Thank you. Any other questions for our panelists? Yes, go ahead. So I'll, I'll repeat the questions while one of you comes up. The question is, how do we motivate our students to take those financial education courses, whether they're presented online or through video? Well, we took another bold step. We don't, um, we tell students that they need to go to a borrowing workshop or a financial literacy workshop before that loan is dispersed. And they do that. And they do it in mass. And they, many of the students come out of those workshops either reducing their loans or declining them. We're actually pulling that data right now. I've looked at it anecdotally. And, um, and we're going to start incorporating that data into the other data of changing our students' behavior. That's what this is about, making them aware and changing their behavior. So that's how we get them to go. And we've had to add workshops all over the place because so many of them are taking advantage of that. And one of the unintended consequences of the debt management workshops is what we call it, um, is that the parents come up to us and say, I sat in one of those workshops and I'm changed. This was when we were offering unsub loans. She said, I'm paying that loan off. You can take that loan back. I don't want that loan for my child. I'm not paying all that interest. And she said, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be in these workshops with our students and for the students themselves. So. I'm going to make a shameless plug. Uh, tomorrow, there's a workshop, Financial Empowerment for Student Success, Lessons from ATD, MDC, Bank of America Partnerships. And one of my colleagues, uh, Kim Koladoye, uh, was heavily involved in a grant program where we have embedded finan uh, financial literacy uh, segment within our student success courses. So I'm not going to steal her thunder, but I would encourage you to uh, attend that session and find out more about that. So I think we've got time for maybe two more questions, and I think I can see you right through the light. Mm -hmm. uh, our
Well, um, it comes in uh, social service, like social work, nursing, um, low-income teaching areas, and we do give our students that information, and the programs give the students the information as well. And those loan repayments are very specific, um, and you have to consolidate the loans under the federal student loan program, and you can only do it one time um, in order to do that. Um, and you have to make 10 years of consecutive payments, not going into forbearance, not doing anything before they are forgiven. Now, it is still a very good program and some, and clearly information that we should give our students. So, yes, we do give them information, especially the students in health science programs and our teacher education programs and other type of social work programs. We're raising the awareness about the loan forgiveness, yes. Uh, my question was, uh, are students more willing to participate in the aid like a is it paycheck uh, if they're the um, new students coming in, or is these students that's already at the college, returning students? Some people can probably answer right here. You can hear me, right? Yes. Yes, we allow new students to participate. Any Pell eligible student, what, what we're looking for is a credit balance that's substantial enough to be able to divide it into But the students that are volunteering to participate in the program, are they the new students that's coming? Are you getting more of the new students or the students that's already receiving um, or are dispersing aid, you know, the one time or two time and choosing to do the uh, disbursement in the eight um, payments? In the first two semesters, we were recruiting students to participate, new and continuing. Okay. And, um, you know, I think that was one of our challenges is that, you know, we have this culture of a single or, or two disbursements. And so you present this idea that's very different from what they're accustomed to and they're a little reluctant. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge to recruit new students. But this semester, and, and it's not the fall, I mean, these are, you know, just some new students coming in for spring. Now, those students who've completed the financial aid process for, for spring, we randomly assigned them into the program. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. I think our, our student is, and then after that, we have our students gonna ask the final question. Go ahead. I would just like to ask about the, um, the disbursements. How do they go if a student doesn't withdraw but stops attending class and is not passing the class, does that matter? So I'm actually glad you asked that question because one of the things that we've done with Aid Like a Paycheck is we've just embedded it into the college's regular financial aid distribution practices. So if the college looked at enrollment that closely and, and monitored seat time, then that would be reflective in Aid Like a Paycheck. I'm, I don't think either one of our institutions, try, um, Pat, I don't think you monitor seat time. They don't monitor seat time, so I don't know how that's changing, but that is something that we've thought about moving forward. Should we make that a requirement? But we didn't push it because that seems to be cumbersome for the overall financial aid landscape for colleges who don't do that already. So our general practice is, however the college disperses aid already in terms of if you look at seat time and when you withdraw, that is how Aid Like a Paycheck lays on top of it. Whether or not we change that, I don't know. But I was going to also add, um, if an institution uh, is thinking about it, many institutions have uh, implemented the FX grade. So it's basically you know, for return of Title IV purposes so that a uh, faculty member will either give a failing grade or an FX grade if the student just stops attending. Yeah, 
Um, I just, how you doing everybody, by the way, just to reintroduce myself, my name's Evan Gonzalez, just in case anybody doesn't know, okay. Um, um, I was interested, I was, well, actually, the workshop for financial literacy, I was wondering why it isn't mandatory, because in, in my friend, my friend, what is it, Tarrant? No, Tarrant, the, the college. Tarrant Community College, they have a mandatory workshop where they have to take that, that is for the student loans. In Kingsborough, we don't have any workshops. So I was just wondering, like, why wouldn't that? So that's a great question, and that's a fantastic question. And people who are much wiser than me once said, students don't do optional. And so the, the question that we have here in this profession, in this room, is drawing that balance between doing those processes and those requirements that we know are good for our students, and the balance between that and being so rigid that then we're ebbing the same students we're trying to serve. And I think that's a very good question. Uh, to my colleagues who are trying to reimagine financial aid, I would I invite you to imagine a day where we would have a system that delivers aid in the way that aid like a paycheck does, a system that allows the discretion to tell a student or a family not to borrow all they need to borrow, and a system that engages students in the way they want to learn. So I would invite them to think in that way, and I would leave us here by saying thank you all and thank you to our panelists. You did great. You guys did fantastic.